on World News Tonight. Forging ties. The Shanghai Cooperation Organization welcomes Iran to its circle, with the summit expressing unity among Eurasian powers. Returning fire. Israel's military pullout from Jenin marked by Hamas's violence in Tel Aviv. Nuclear contention. The IAEA greenlights Japan's move to release Fukushima's wastewater, despite calls for prevention. And happy fourth. The United States celebrates Independence Day with a sky full of pyrotechnic prowess. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight, reporting from Colombo. Here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A very good evening and you are watching World News. We have a number of coverages from across the globe for you tonight, starting off in neighbouring India. At the Shanghai Corporation Organisation Summit, Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi said China, India, Iran, Pakistan, Russia and Central Asian countries should jointly fight terrorism, help Afghanistan and tackle global challenges such as food, fuel and fertiliser shortages. Modi was hosting the virtual summit of Shanghai Cooperation Organization as the Eurasian Political and Security Group seeks to expand its influence by accepting Iran as a member. Iran became the ninth member to join the Shanghai Cooperation Organization as the Eurasian grouping seeks to forge closer ties. President of Iran, Ibrahim Raisi, said that the country wanted to share its experience with the security and political grouping so that its members could move towards a terrorist-free region. Russian President Vladimir Putin, China's President Xi Jinping and leaders of four central Asian countries took part in the online proceedings as well as Iranian President Ibrahim Raisi. Iran is due to join as the ninth member and Belarus will sign a memorandum of obligations which will lead to its membership later. A joint declaration by the leaders at the end of the online summit hosted by India also said the SCO opposes the resolution of international and regional issues through collectivization, ideology and confrontational thinking. Formed in 2001 by China and Russia with former Soviet Central Asian states as members and joined later by India and Pakistan, the SCO seeks to counter Western influence in Eurasia. Meanwhile, Israel has withdrawn its forces from the Palestinian city of Jenin after carrying out one of their biggest military operations in the occupied West Bank for years. As the troops left, Palestinian militants in the Gaza Strip fired five rockets towards Israel, which were intercepted with no immediate reports of casualties. Defiantly waves a Palestinian flag as Israeli forces sweep through the Jenin refugee camp. Israel's army pulled out after a two-day raid, leaving behind streets ripped up by bulldozers and littered with debris. Hundreds of troops were used in the operation, the biggest for several years in the occupied West Bank. Palestinian officials say the fighting forced 3,000 people from their homes. Families have been left to fend for themselves, with supplies of both water and electricity cut off. The Israeli soldiers took the young men of my family to the upper floor and they left the women and children trapped on the first floor. They closed the door on us. I asked them for food and water for the children. They said yes, but they left without bringing us anything. Israel says the operation aimed to hunt down the camp's militants and destroy their weapons. Speaking at a military post on the outskirts of Jenin, Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said he wouldn't hesitate to order fresh raids in the future. We will continue as long as necessary to root out terrorism. We will not allow Jenin to return to being a safe haven for terrorists. And we will cut off and strike terrorism wherever we see it. Violence has erupted across the occupied West Bank in recent months. Over 140 Palestinians and at least 25 Israelis have been killed in attacks across the territory since the start of the year. Now, Russia accused the US and its allies of helping Ukraine launch a drone attack aimed at Moscow and its surroundings, temporarily disrupting air traffic at a major international airport. Meanwhile, Ukraine returns all the same with accusations of staging an attack on the highly contested Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. Ukraine and Russia have accused the other of planning attacks that could set off nuclear disaster. Just weeks after conducting emergency response drills, Kyiv warned again that Russia is threatening to attack Europe's biggest nuclear power plant. Moscow has accused Ukraine of doing the same. The Zaporizhia nuclear power station, seen here in footage released by the Russian National Guard press service, has long been the subject of mutual recriminations and suspicions. Russian troops seized the station in the days following the Kremlin's invasion of Ukraine in February 2022. 
Each side has regularly accused the other of shelling around the plant and risking a major nuclear mishap. But in his nightly video message, Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky said Russia was now planning to, quote, simulate an attack on the plant. The whole world must now realize that common security depends entirely on global attention to the actions of the occupiers at the plant. Russia must clearly realize that the world sees the scenarios terrorists are preparing for and the world is ready to respond. Radiation threatens everyone in the world and the nuclear power plant must be fully protected from any radiation incidents. In an earlier statement, Ukrainian armed forces quoted operational data as saying that explosive devices had been placed on the roof of the station's third and fourth reactors on Tuesday. A spokesman for Russia's nuclear network operator, meanwhile, said Ukraine planned to drop ammunition laced with nuclear waste transported from another of the country's five nuclear stations on the plant. The UN's nuclear watchdog, the IAEA, has been trying for more than a year to get all sides to agree to demilitarize the plant. IAEA Director General Rafael Grossi has visited the plant three times since the Russian takeover, most recently on June the 15th. So far, he's failed to reach any agreement to keep the facility safe from shelling. An advisor to Vladimir Zelensky reportedly told Ukrainian television that Grossi had proved ineffective. Worries have also grown over the potential for an accident at the plant. That's after a local dam used to cool reactors was destroyed. Last month, pictures were released showing the breach of the Kakova Dam on the Dnipro River. Ukraine said Russia had destroyed a hydroelectric power plant at the site from the inside. Moscow blamed Kyiv. The IAEA said at the time that a local pond meant the plant should still be stable for, quote, some months. Now, Japan won approval from the UN's nuclear watchdog for its plan to release treated radioactive water from the tsunami-wrecked Fukushima plant into the ocean, despite fierce resistance from Beijing and some local residents. For more on this, we have other there in the World News special correspondent Anjali Vijayaka from Fukuoka in Japan. Anjali, what's the latest? Yes, Anradi. Japan is set to begin pumping out more than a million tons of treated water from the destroyed Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant this summer, a process that will take decades to complete. Internal Atomic Energy Agency Chief Rafael Grossi called it a very special night as he handed Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida the final report after a two-year review. Japan hasn't specified a date to start the release of the water, enough to fill 500 Olympic-sized swimming pools. Fishing unions said the action would undo work to repair reputations after several countries banned some Japanese food products after the disaster. Some neighboring countries have also complained over the years about the threat to the marine environment and public health. With Beijing emerging as the biggest critic, China's ambassador to Japan urged for the suspension of the plan shortly before the announcement of approval. South Korea is also planning on releasing their own review of the situation. Back to you, Andrade. All right, thank you. That was other than a world news special correspondent Anjali Vijayaratna from Fukuoka in Japan. Now, in an update on the violence in France, French President Emmanuel Macron met with hundreds of French officials to begin exploring the deeper reasons for the country's plunge into riots after the killing of a teenager at a traffic stop. A week after 17-year-old Nahel was killed during a traffic stop, Emmanuel Macron is beginning to count the cost of a week of riots. This Tuesday, he welcomed the mayors of 250 municipalities to the Elysee Palace, all of them victims of the violence in one way or another. The ruling authorities are faced with a major crisis of legitimacy, but are also giving mayors more powers so they're better equipped to get to work. In front of elected officials from across the political spectrum, France's president pressed the need to restore law and order. There'll be a time when we can debate each other politically and reach conclusions. But today, we need a return to calm. We need to put on a united front. Since last Tuesday, elected officials have been attacked at least 13 times, according to the Interior Ministry. Amongst them, the mayors of Les Roses and Pontoise. Calls are growing for new measures to punish the perpetrators. Given recent events, we should consider doing more by beefing up judicial measures and by giving mayors more powers. I've been saying for years that municipal police forces should be given drones. 
Almost 3,500 people were arrested and more than 12,000 vehicles were set alight in a week of reckless violence that France is still coming to terms with. Let's go in for a short commercial break. You're watching World News. Welcome back. NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg will remain in his post until October 2024, extending his post by another year amid a failure to agree on a replacement given the war in Ukraine. The NATO military alliance has decided to extend the tenure of its leader, Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg, for another year to October 2024. Rather than try to find a successor as it deals with Russia and the war in Ukraine raging on its doorstep. This was Stoltenberg meeting with Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky in Kyiv earlier this year. Stoltenberg's term was supposed to end this coming September, although the extension isn't totally unexpected by NATO watchers. He's been in the job since 2014 and was already extended three times. A debate on who could replace him has been raging behind closed doors in European and North American capitals for a while, with no obvious frontrunner. Stoltenberg has a lot on his plate. In addition to the immediate problems of the war, such as strategy and weapon donations to Ukraine, NATO is trying to negotiate Sweden's bid for membership. Hungary and Turkey have so far blocked it. Ukraine, too, has been pressing to join NATO soon after the war ends. There's also the long-term problem of whether NATO should become more involved in Asia, countering China, which the U.S. has been pushing for, although France would rather keep focus on the North Atlantic. Stoltenberg is the former Prime Minister of Norway and is widely seen across the alliance as a steady leader and patient person while building consensus. Now on an environmental front, the World Meteorological Organization said that temperatures are expected to soar across large parts of the world after the El Nino weather pattern emerged in the tropical Pacific for the first time in seven years. The El Nino weather pattern has returned, bringing surging temperatures with it. We are likely to have one of the warmest year on record. For the first time in seven years, the World Meteorological Organization says El Nino has emerged in the tropical Pacific. So what exactly is it? El Nino is a natural climate pattern born out of unusually warm waters in the eastern Pacific though scientists are not entirely sure what kicks off the cycle. It's been linked to extreme weather conditions, from tropical cyclones to heavy rainfall to severe droughts. The world's hottest year on record, 2016, coincided with a strong El Nino. And the WMO says even that record could soon be broken. WMO's head of the Regional Climate Prediction Service, Wilfred Mafuma Okia. The tropical Pacific Ocean is currently experiencing uh, a Nino condition. And this is a result of a rapid and um, substantive change, both in the atmosphere and in the ocean. So what impact could El Nino have on global temperatures? During an El Nino, the southern US sees cooler and wetter weather, while parts of the US West and Canada are warmer and drier. Australia, Parts of Southern Asia and Central America usually endure extreme heat, drought and bushfires. And increased rainfall could hit Southern America, the Horn of Africa and Central Asia. Last month, we issued, uh, WMO issued uh, what we call the five years outlook. So basically, we try to anticipate the climate for the period 2023 to 2027. What we know is that throughout the next five years, we are likely to have one of the warmest years on record. Adding on to these worries, more than 100,000 Havana residents are without water as the heat of the Caribbean summer sets in, raising tensions on the streets of Cuba's capital as the crisis-wracked government scrambles to find a solution. These tankers in Havana are being filled with water, now a rare commodity for thousands of residents in the Cuban capital. Between 100,000 and 200,000 people in Havana, or as much as 10% of its population, are without access to it, according to state media. Residents 
have an idea why. We've used the same pumping system for so many years. I'm not very knowledgeable about this, but you get to the point where if you don't fix or change anything, years take their toll. Like old people that are healthy until they get sick. Local officials say aging infrastructure is a factor. They add climate change induced drought doesn't help either. It's all making daily life more difficult for people like old Havana resident Ania Batista. We haven't had water for many days, she says. The water issue is bad, very bad. The water woes come while the communist-run country is going through one of its worst economic crises in decades. Tough U.S. sanctions, floundering tourism, soaring inflation, and short supplies of food, medicine, and fuel are all slamming the island. A top provincial Communist Party official says nearly two dozen new pumps will help with the water shortages. But Luis Antonio Torres says they won't arrive for weeks. We must do everything we can, even the impossible, so that people get water and monitor who's the most affected so that water gets to them. Meanwhile, the local government is also asking people to save energy, with demand outpacing its forecasts. Blackouts are a thorny subject in Cuba. They, in part, fed into anger that sparked anti-government protests across the island, including demonstrations in July 2021, believed to be the largest since former leader Fidel Castro's 1959 revolution. Now, Meta Platforms is set to launch Threads, a text-based microblogging app to rival Twitter. The debut comes after Twitter announced a slew of restrictions on its app. Meta Platforms is launching a rival to Twitter, dubbed Threads, on Thursday. The new product is a text-based microblogging app connected to Meta's Instagram. Users will be able to follow the same accounts as they do on the photo-sharing app and keep the same username. That's according to its listing on Apple's App Store. Social media analyst Drew Benvy says the new product looks like a serious challenger. I think Threads is going to pose a huge threat to Twitter uh, because it's coming from the Meta and Instagram family of apps. Instagram has 2 billion users compared to around 250 million uh, of Twitter, so it's about 10 times bigger already. So if, if only one in 10 Instagram users tries using Threads, it's overtaken Twitter in the blink of an eye. Meta did not immediately respond to requests for comment on whether it would also launch on the Google Play Store. The debut comes after Twitter announced a slew of restrictions on its app. Musk said users would have a limited number of posts they could read per day to address extreme levels of data scraping and system manipulation. Benby says it's really further evidence of the troubles that have plagued the network under its new owner. Since Elon Musk took over, the system itself isn't working as well as it should. Just over the weekend, we saw Twitter go down and then limits put in place for users so that it doesn't break the servers again. Users will also need to be verified in order to use TweetDeck, a popular app for viewing and managing Twitter accounts. The announcement came in a tweet detailing an improved version of TweetDeck with new features. Musk's latest moves have sparked a fierce backlash from Twitter users. Ad experts say they would also undermine new CEO Linda Iacorino, who started in the role last month. Welcome back, and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. International election observers are set to return to Guatemala to monitor a court-ordered review of ballots from the presidential vote. The Washington-based OAS took the unusual step of swiftly returning its observer mission back to Guatemala after its constitutional court called for a review of the election's first round. The U.S. Secret Service is investigating after cocaine was found at the White House on Sunday night. The discovery of the West Wing, which contains the Oval Office and other working areas for presidential aides and staff, led to a brief evacuation. Torrential downpours and flooding have killed at least 15 people and four others remain missing 
missing in Chongqing, Southwest China. Chinese leader Xi Jinping has ordered authorities to give top priority to keeping residents safe and minimizing losses. Mechanical failure on roller coaster led to a dramatic rescue at a Forest County Festival in Clandon, Wisconsin, after the ride left festival goers hanging upside down for hours. Britain's Prince and Princess of Wales marked 75 years of National Health Service at a tea party in London. The NHS has endured a winter of crisis and Prime Minister Rishi Sunak has made cutting patient waiting lists one of his prime priorities for the year. And that is all from us here at World News Tonight. Join us again tomorrow as we keep you up to date with the latest from around the world. In case you missed any of the stories tonight, you can always rewatch the whole program on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash other than English. We leave you tonight with spectacular views of fireworks painting the night sky to celebrate the 4th of July. Thank you for watching. Have a great night.